Without uh, any delay, I want to introduce to you my guest, the beautiful, amazing, ridiculously hot, yet so humble, my wife, Ashley Livingston. Can you guys give it up for her? All right, so, uh, man, we are so excited uh, to be with you guys today, and, and I get to do this once a year because she won't do it any more often than that. Uh, uh, if you don't know my wife, she, this, this is Ashley, by the way, so for some of you, she does exist, all right, so you've been here a year, you don't know who she is, uh, she does exist, and um, we, we, we want to share today, we're talking about marriage, and so in the Sushi, Sex, and Subtitle series, we've, we've talked about uh, dating, we've talked about singleness, we've talked about sex. Today we want to talk about marriage, but it, it's, it is in a way that we know that even if you're single, man, grab a hold of what we're going to talk about today. And uh, we do not claim to have all the wisdom in the world <laughs> about all these things. Matter of fact, a lot of what we're going to share with you today, someone else older than us shared it with us, okay? Um, but we do have some stories of how we persevered through certain things. Um, because I know, uh, you know, in our lives, we, we've, we've gone through a lot. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll share some of those stories. But uh, the reality is, the first thing I want to talk about, how many guys know that men and women are completely different creatures? Come on, help me out. How many guys know men and women are completely different creatures? you got to learn to embrace the different creatures, right, and their needs. Yeah. <clears throat> and we have to learn that men are just simple creatures. They only want <laughs> they only want a few things: uh, food, water, peace, and this is really hard to say because my dad's in the room. Sex. <laughs> <laughs> when you're married, yeah, 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 yeah. When you're married, when yeah. you're married. Yeah. So, so what you're saying, ladies, learn to embrace the reality that men are simple creatures. All right, we really are. Matter of fact, we have a video to show you all all it takes for a man to 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 for a man to be delighted. Go ahead and show show the video, guys. This we're simple creatures, really. This is all we really want out of life. Shooting fireworks off a helicopter. That's all, like, look, all the men in the room are like, yeah, yeah. So we're simple creatures. Uh, but here's the other thing that we have to learn. So as much as men are simple creatures is that, men, we have to learn that the ladies, guys, we have to learn to embrace the reality that women are complex creatures. They are complex creatures, right? And, and the, rea the reality is this, well, the, is that all, all they really need, listen, all they really need is nurturing, reassurance, laughter, to feel wanted, safe, protected, comforted, pursued, valued, understood, embraced, <laughs> secure, confident, and heard. That's all they need in their lives. And so, no, the reality is they want to be loved, they want to be understood. As a matter of fact, we have a great video we want to show you guys that I think really rolls out what it looks like to communicate with our wives in a powerful way. Go ahead, guys. There's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head it is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine, I will listen, fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on, Ow. if you would just- Don't! <laughs> All right, so uh, we are very simple yet complex creatures, all right? So uh, it's not about the nail, fellas. It's not about the nail. But isn't it? But, you know, uh, no, listen, we're, Ashley and I have been through a lot 
you know, for those of you that don't know, we've, uh, her, her, her mom went to be with the Lord uh, shortly after we got married. Um, and her father's here. Uh, God, we, I, we, I don't often get to honor my father-in-law, but because my wife is on stage, I want to honor Guy Bowett. He's in the room. You're, you're going to cry, aren't you? Yeah. All right. So, um, but, uh, and then we lost our son. Our son went through a three-year uh, brain disease, and then he passed away in 2018. So, uh, I, I, we, we don't, we're not the master of anything up here, but what we do know is we, we've persevered through some difficult seasons in life. And we just want to give you a little bit of help as to what that looks like. Uh, and I'm sorry, I messed you all up before you got to speak. So that's, that's my fault. Um, but, uh, but about what it looks like to really, to really embrace one another and how to exist in marriage with one another. And not just exist, but thrive. Turn your name and say thrive. And so that's what we want to start with. Uh, we want to give you kind of three things on, uh, as to exactly what that looks like and how we've seen it be successful in our marriage. Yeah, so the first thing is we need to learn how to lean into each other. So lean in, rely on, trust each other, because when we do that through the, the easy times, the good times, it makes it easier during the difficult and the hard times to, to lean on each other and trust each other during those times. Yeah, I mean, and I think the reality is this. I think so many people in their li- in, in our relationships is, is we're making the easy seasons difficult, which makes the difficult seasons impossible. So it's like we're, you know, we're we're having stupid arguments. We're being passive aggressive towards each other when things are good. And it's like, man, if if you're if you're making things fall apart when you're good, how do you think this is going to go when it gets bad? You know, because how many guys have realized life has something around every corner almost to throw you off and to catch you off guard? And so, uh, like Ashley said, we got to learn to to lean into each other. Um, and, re- and rely on each other and trust in each other and embrace in each other. And so uh, the, the, the next thing I want you to understand is that we, we have to learn to communicate. When we're talking about leaning into each other. We must learn to communicate in a way the other person will hear it. When we're talking about marriage. We got to learn to communicate in a way the other person will hear it. How many guys have ever been in a, com- in a conversation and you're like, you're not hearing what I'm saying? Anybody? If you're married, just raise your hand. You don't even like, you know, like, um, and here's the thing, guys, we have to learn to communicate with someone who speaks a completely different language. They speak, women speak a completely different language, and we have to learn to communicate with them. You know, one of the things that, one of the rules we kind of have in our house is, like, we just don't do passive aggressive in our house. Like, we, we, we don't, I, I, A, I just don't deal with it very well, but we don't do passive aggressive stuff. Now, now we'll joke passive aggressively. Right, but we we don't do true passive aggression in our house, and so we have to learn to communicate with someone who speaks a completely different language. And learning here's the thing that I think is important, especially for men out there. Men, you got to learn to read in between the lines of your wife. You got to learn. You, you got to learn. Come on, you got to learn body language, cryptic communication. Right, you got to learn to hear the thing they didn't say. Come on, right, and then you got to hear the thing that they did say multiple times which is our favorite thing, right? Listen, if we said we're going to get to it, ladies, we will. You don't have to remind us every six months, all right? We're going to, I promise, we're going to, we're going to. But no, the, the truth be told is we do speak completely different languages. So listen, we have to learn to communicate with our spouse the way they communicate and not make demands that they communicate the way we communicate. Because that's what we often expect is that they would do that. But it's also something for the ladies too, right? Yeah, and I think as women, we have to learn that the timing of a conversation is just as important as, a, as the topic. Um, knowing that just because we want to have the conversation right now and they're not ready, usually it leads, it's not a wise decision in that, in that moment. Yeah, I mean, how many times have we pressed a conversation that could have waited till later? Come on, help me out. I mean, it could be work, but I'm, I'm, we're talking about marriage today. Like, how many times have we been like, no, we're going to have this conversation now? And how often did that work? Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, even for us. Like, that, that you, you, it's all about timing, right? So, and it's, it's important because we, we have to understand. Um, and there's one thing Ashley brought up when we were talking about this, the one thing that you brought up in the notes. What is that? That, yeah, reactive conversations rarely lead to resolutions. Um, they usually lead to resentment. Yeah, that's so true. That, that reactive conversations, they rarely lead to resolutions. They usually lead to resentment. And so um, 
We have to understand what it is that God wants us to, to, to do in our marriages and how we're existing together. I think that's why Proverbs 21.9, this is in the message paraphrase, but it says this, better to live alone in a tumble down shack than share a mansion with a nagging spouse. Now, I think the original translation said wife, just for the record. But, you know, we're, we're leveling the playing field out here. So send all your emails to uh, Pastor Justin at Transformation Church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, but in all seriousness, the, the Bible, this, is, this is some truth right here. Because when, when what we want is peace, we got to realize it. We, many people, we would sacrifice a lot to make sure we have peace. Come on, help me out. And that's what we have to realize. So, uh, you know, having a nagging spouse uh, can bring anything, uh, anything down. And, and we've worked, uh, Ashley and I have worked hard on understanding each other, you know. Yeah, one of the greatest things we did to learn to communicate was learn about the Enneagram. Um, we learned how, e- how each other communicates, when they need to be communicated with, um, the different avenues. And I learned Brad sometimes his thing is anger. So I learned when he's getting to that fuse point to not try to tell him, hey, don't feel this way. Don't, uh, don't try to fix it that way. But more just be there with him. Don't smother him in that moment and try to smother that fuse. Just I learned to be there with him in that moment. Yeah. Uh, and for the record, it's not anger at her, just so we're clear. Yeah, no, that right? wouldn't so, happen. Some of you are like, God, get out of that house, woman. No, <laughs> it's not anger at her. It's just like. My general vice, uh, that's why we laugh a lot. I like to laugh a lot because the alternative is I can get angry quickly. Uh, and so the Enneagram has helped her understand a language, uh, and we're not promoting that necessarily as much as we're just saying it was a helpful tool for us to understand each other um, because I, I, as, a, as an Enneagram 8, which is my, you know, my space, it's like one of the things I have to grow in is the fact that I kind of have lava running under the surface of my emotions all the time, which means anger is easily tapped into at any given time. Um, and because we use the, the language we use is that there's lava under the surface. The problem is, is if that lava is coming to the surface and she goes and tries to pour a cup of cold water on it, who do you think's getting steam in the face? She is. And it, it, she, she, she wanted to do the right thing, but because it was the wrong time and she tried to smother something, it's like, listen, I'll calm myself down. All right. I'm not really going to go through town and like tear everything up. I just need a minute to work that through my thoughts. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, and so, uh, so I'm going to calm myself down. But if you try to calm me down, you're going to end up getting hurt in the process. And granted, now listen, that's something I need to work on. So that's not an excuse to just be who you are. I have to work on that. But the reality is, if she can understand, no, nah, let me just be present in this. And to be honest with you, one of my favorite things is when she tries to get in the boat with me. So when I'm like heated and she's like, let's just go, let's burn it all down. I'm like, let's <laughs> go right now. So, um, you know, ladies, perhaps that's what you need to do with your husband. I don't know. But uh, so, yeah, she's like, let's just get their address. We'll go there right now. I'm like, let, let's go. I've never been more attracted to you in my life than this moment. Uh, <laughs> But for, but for, but for Ashley, uh, you know, it's the same thing that, um, you know, one of the things I had to learn, we've gone through a lot of loss, like we talked about between our son, her mom, like we've gone through loss and, and I'm a fixer by nature. So just let me fix it. You know what I mean? It's the nail thing. I promise we can. Um, and she does not like to be comforted physically when she's going through grief. So, like, when we lost, when she lost her mom, I, I remember I, I went into the room, she was crying, and I, like, put my arm around her, and I'm, like, rubbing her back, and she finally at one point looked at me, and she's like, stop touching me. I wasn't that aggressive with it. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, <laughs> so she just, she gave me this scowl. She's like, stop touching me. And then when, when, through Jabe and everything, like, there was one thing I realized, okay. And then she was like, I don't want you touching me. Just sit next to me. And I was like, you know, I put my hands on my knees. And, she, and uh, she's like, just be here. And I'm like, this is exhausting, actually. Like, so, uh, but the, rea- the reality is, is that it helped me understand what she needs. And what we're getting at is communicating and having a language. that so We have to understand each other. And we have to be able to communicate. But here's the deal. we got to lean into each other because life is going to want you to lean out. Life is going to cause you to want to lead away from each other. And if we're not learning to lean into each other, we're going to miss out on great opportunities. I think that's why Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, 
So the Bible talks about how wives are submit to their husbands and all those things, but hear me, the reality is we submit to, we lean into each other, and as we lean into each other, we're relying and submitting on into one another. So I'm saying I need you to hold me while I hold you as we lean in, and as long as we're leaning in, we won't be tempted to lean out. Does that make sense? And so we've got to make sure that we're, we're looking at that. But the next thing we have to understand, the second point that we've realized in our marriage, is that you're oftentimes going to have to lead forward when necessary. So we lean in to each other, but there's going to be moments where you have to lead forward when necessary. And what I mean by that is there's going to be a season, and it's usually the husband, where because you're praying, your wife may not be ready to move, but God is calling your family to go somewhere. And it's up, listen, there's always, there's going to be seasons where the husband has to lead and maybe even sometimes the wife. I'm sure that happens occasionally where the wife is the spiritual leader in the home, but I'm challenging husbands. There are seasons where we have to lead forward. Even when my wife goes, I I don't know if I'm comfortable with this. I don't know if I'm ready for this, but God's saying, no, 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 you got to get your house ready for what's coming. And you have to lead forward when necessary. Yeah, and the the biggest time in our marriage was when Brad had to really lead me was when we lost our son. And I'm going to be uh, super vulnerable, which I hate because I don't like talking about my emotions or, or anything like that. But um, when that happened, I told him ahead of time. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to be with God if, if he takes Jabin. I don't, I just want to prepare you. I don't know where I'm going to be at. Um, so I, I knew I would never lose my faith. That was not my struggle. I knew, you know, God loved me. I knew, um, who he was, what he did for us, all of that. My, my faith, I never had doubts about what I was afraid of is my relationship with God. I didn't know how that was going to look. Um, and it, it, it's what happened. I, um, for about four years after, towards the end of it, and then about four years after, I built up the highest walls that could have been between me and God. I, and I hope this doesn't make y'all see me any different as, you know, the pastor's wife, or, but um, I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to worship. I didn't want to come to church. Um, I just, I knew God loved me, but it was more of a I'm angry and I'm hurt, and I just don't want to do it. And um, it was it was very hard um, because things would happen. Like I remember, and I hope you don't mind me saying, Pastor Dan would come home and he would say he had these dreams about Jabin, and he saw him in heaven, you know, with a with a baseball glove and he, you know playing baseball, and he was having all these amazing dreams and. Literally, all I was having was nightmares. I was just, you know, reliving it over and over. Sorry. Um, so that just made my walls go even higher. I was so angry with God. Like, why? Why is everyone else getting all these great dreams and I'm having nightmares? You know, reliving it all over. But, um,. <clears throat> About two years ago, right about two years ago, things started changing in my spirit. I started longing again for that relationship, and I, I would tell God, you know, <laughs> I, <don't> know God. <laughs> I could, I could still feel the walls up, and I would pray, you know, God, I, I don't know how to have this relationship with you. I need you to help me because I'm still angry. I. I don't know how to break through this wall, and I need you to help me. And to be honest, I still struggle with that today. I'm, I'm still working on that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. But through all that, you know, Brad was very patient with me. He was very understanding, and he helped lead me uh, when I was too hurt to even know that I still needed to walk. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The the and the conversations during that season, you know, it was it was a lot of like when you can't see God, just follow me. And and 
and that's what, you know, we, because we trust each other to lean into each other, when the time came that I had to lead her, she trusted me because we weren't creating things out of nothing during the lean season. She could trust me in the lead season. You with me? And so, and so it was a lot of like us having those conversations and me going, follow me. I like, you know, and, and us having honest conversations. She was, I told her, I want you to be as honest with me as you need to be, but just know that, that I'm trusting that God's going to get us through this. Um, and that was a real season um, for us, which kind of brings us to the next thing that we need to understand is that we really have to learn to embrace each other's needs. Now, you're going to go through seasons where you got to learn to embrace each other's needs. Everyone's going to have different needs. And, and, and in that season, Ashley had unique needs. And to be honest with you, there ain't a pamphlet out there to help you learn as a husband how to navigate that with your wife. You know, I'm pastoring the church and we're having conversations on our back porch, and she's going, I don't know how I feel about God right now. And we're going, well, praise God, Sunday's going to be great. You know, like, uh, and, and that was like, that was our reality. But here's what I knew. As long as I could make sure I stayed close enough to God and she stayed close enough to me, we'd always be where we needed to be. And, and that's what, and so I knew what her needs were. And so, you know, we have to, we have to, to realize that and that we just have different needs. Um, you okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, and we have to be vulnerable and realize that we have to have that relationships or otherwise it can sometimes feel like you're just roommates you know you're just living life together but when you're leaning in and leading each other um, that's when that vulnerability comes out and if we as wives if we don't become the nurturer of his vulnerability we can't expect for him to care for us delicately so, like, uh, a husband who has his armor on at home will unintentionally cut the ones he loves, is how I put it. So, without that space for him to remove that armor when he comes home, um, after being at war with the world all day, or just having that up, you know, when he comes home, he needs to be able to take that off. And if the first thing that happens when he walks in the door is we're starting up that fight again, or we're starting that argument, or... We're yelling at him, reminding him that he didn't take out the trash after the 17th time of reminding him. That's probably not the time, but we are going to remind him again. Uh, <laughs> but just for him to have that safe space to come in and just, like, remove the armor so that he's not um, wearing it as soon as he walks in and we start arguing or something and then one of us gets cut. Yeah, it's so true. And, and you know, when we talk about that, it's like, you know, I think oftentimes women, they want to experience the warmth of their husband, but they keep creating environments for him to be rigid and cold. And it's like, we have to understand lady, that women in particular, wives, you actually have a lot more control over your husband's demeanor than you might realize by, by cultivating and embracing his vulnerabilities, which kind of brings us to the next thing. It's like, especially for, for, for men, guys, that we have to be vulnerable with our wives because being vulnerable with our wives lets us be partners, not just roommates. And so it's our vulnerability that creates those connections. And so we have to embrace that. And I put it, I put it like this, vulnerability and nurturing, let our spouse be a partner in our life, not just an accessory to our life. And so like it's the, it is that vulnerability, it's that transparency. And I think men constantly, we find ourselves in this place where it's like we need to be, we need to be, you know, the man. We got to be Superman. We can't show our emotions. We got to be rigid. We got to, and it's like, you know, we have to, we do have to be strong, but your wife needs to be the place that you can expose your weakness the most. Like she has to know that she can, that she can be comforted in your weakness. And, and so that vulnerability creates an environment for a healthy marriage, right? And so Ephesians 5, 21 through 23, uh, in, in this unique translation says, follow the lead of one another because of your respect for Christ. The husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. The church is Christ's body. He is its savior. So the church follows the lead of Christ, and in the same way, wives should follow the lead of their husbands in everything they do. And there's this one thing that I just wanted to bring up, because I think it happens in marriage all the time, especially this generation. This generation is the first generation that's ever had to deal with this, and that is that uh, we lose connection to the people in our home because we're connecting with everyone else outside our home. And in Proverbs 27, 23 through 24, it says, be sure to know the condition of your flocks, right? Know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. And that is talking about a kingdom. Well, how many of you guys know our home is a kingdom? 
And we have to be, I have to be aware of the condition of my flock, my wife. And if you have children, your children, you got to know what's going on in their world. You got to know what they're going through. You need to be aware of their condition because, listen, the good, like, for, for example, riches do not endure forever. Listen, the good times you're having right now won't last forever. Right, right around the corner, how many guys know there's something else that's probably going to pop up, right? So the good times don't last forever. You need to know the conditions of your flock because when you go through some things, you're going to need to know how to lead that person. And one of the things I think is so interesting is we've stopped talking to each other and started telling everyone on social media what we're going through. And listen, we have to stop using social media to communicate to an audience of none rather than sharing our burdens with the audience of one. Like, our, my spouse is who I share with. So, so listen, and especially, I feel like millennials and, and our, my generation is the worst at this, but I think everyone can take something from this. Stop posting things on social media you need to be telling your spouse. Like, start communicating with your spouse and stop going to social media. Like, I, like I wish they would get rid of the share button on social media because rather than, like, talking about our feelings and embracing and, and even being in community with small groups, rather than going to healthy environments to deal with what we're going through, we're just posting on social media passive aggressively to the world thinking that it's going to change our life, and it's not going to change anything. And so, man, we have to embrace what it looks like to really be communicative with each other. That's why Proverbs eleven fourteen. It says, where there is no guidance, say guidance, where there is no guidance, a person falls and fails, but it's in an abundance of counselors, an abundance of counselors that there is safety. You Listen, you don't need more people feeling sorry for you. You need the right people helping you change. And that's what we have to uh, learn to embrace. And so that's why I think 1 Peter 3, 7 uh, talks to husbands in particular. It says, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Husbands, listen to me right now. You want to see your prayers hindered? Stop loving your wife. How many of us are praying, God, do this in my career. Do this in my, in my workplace. Do this. I, bring, I want to bring in more money. I want to be successful. But you're not loving your wife, and you can't figure out why your prayers are going unanswered. We have to love our spouse. We have to care for our spouse. And if we'll care for our spouse and love our spouse, we can have a confidence in what God's doing in our life, right? And so that leads us to the third point we want to share with you guys today as we get ready to kind of wrap up. And that's the idea that you got to learn to stand strong even when you're weak. you got to learn to stand strong even when you're weak. And one of the ways that we've had to learn to do that in our marriage is that we've had to learn how to hold each other's space. Hold each other's space. And what I mean by that is this, is we, we've had to learn how to, to, to sit in each other's environments and not try to fix problems, but just be present. You know, one of the things I love about Ashley is she really is my best friend. Like, I love to make her laugh. It's my favorite thing in the world to make her laugh. And she thinks the dumbest things in the world are funny. She thinks, like, so uh, I've recently discovered, recently discovered, 14 years of marriage, recently discovered, she loves dad jokes. <laughs> like, loves dad jokes. Cheesy, corny joke. Like, she, I'll send her a little picture. Uh, I'll send her, like, a GIF or a meme or something, and it's like a dad joke. And 10 seconds later, I'll hear her giggling from the other couch. And she's just like, <laughs> and I'm sitting over there. It, it sounds kind of like that. But, and it just like, it makes my heart happy because I'm like, I love, I love that. But I, I, I love to hold my wife's, I love to be present with my wife. I love to be there for her. I love to be there with her. And we get to, to hold each other's space. And that's so important that we learn. Listen, we don't coexist. We genuinely love to be with one another. And you got to learn to love the things about your spouse that makes you want to be with them again. Yeah, and in that holding that space, again, going back to we don't try to fix him. Just start praying for him, which in, you know, with all of our background, for years, I could pray for him, but it was hard to pray for myself. I didn't know how to do that at all. But I would continue to pray for him. And, and if we don't do that, it feels like every time that they're in front of us and we're trying to fix them in front of people, they're, they're thinking, they're putting that armor back on. Like, I can't be myself right now in front of people, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to shut down. Yeah, it's so true. And, um, and, and, and we have to, 
we have to learn to understand that, again, ladies, you have a lot more control over our demeanor than you might think. And, and, and hear me, God can do more in your husband than you can do in your husband. God can fix those things way better than you can, but you got to learn to pray for him. Yeah. And Proverbs 4.23 says, pray for your husband's heart that he would guard it. From it flows the springs of life. Yeah. So, guys, the thing I want to encourage you with is we need to learn to be present in prayer rather than trying to fix her problems. Be present in prayer rather than trying to fix her problems. And you'll notice the stand firm portion is really just about prayer. We stand with each other in prayer. We pray for each other. We love each other. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls down and has no one there to help them up. And listen, marriage is a whole lot of helping the other person up. Come on. I said marriage is a whole lot of helping the other person up. It's a whole lot of needing to be helped up. There's been certain seasons I walked, I, I literally walked in the door. <sighs> this past February, Jabin's birthday was January 24th. And um, this past February, there was just, there was a, there was a couple of days and I walked in and, and she could tell I wasn't okay. And she says, what's going on? And I just said, it's not a good day. And that was all I had to say. And she immediately knew what was happening. She immediately knew what I was talking about. It's not a good day. My emotions were getting the best of me. I was living in my memories, right? I was, I was remembering our son. I was thinking about the what ifs. What if he had lived? What, what would it be like? How would he be? And I was just reliving all those things. And, and how many guys know sometimes the cyclone of our thoughts just runs away? And it was one of those days. It was just not a good day. But that day I had a woman, a wife there to help me up. And listen, we need that in our lives. We need to stand strong because God's going to carry us, but he's going to partner us with people in relationships that can do that. So we got to lean in. We've got to lead forward and we got to stand strong. Now, one of the things that I think is so special about this, first of all, if you're single in here, remember this, single people. If you can't trust them to lean into them, you won't trust them when they lead you. And if you can't trust them when they lead you, you won't trust them to hold you when you need to be standing strong. So find the person that you can lean into, find the person you can trust to lead you, and find the person you can trust to hold you. And if they can't do those things, then they're not for you. All right? The next thing I want you to understand is that everything we just described, we know it's biblical in our marriage because it's biblical in our walk with Christ. Because who do you need to lean into more than anybody? Jesus. How many of you guys have ever been through a season where Jesus needed to lead you and you weren't ready to go yet? But you got to trust him anyways, right? And how many of you guys have ever been in a season where you didn't know if you could stand on your own, but somebody else held you and helped you stand through the process? And so everything we're talking about today, it's about marriage, but it's also about our relationship with Christ. And because it's about our relationship with Christ, we can trust that it's the best thing for our marriage. You with me today? And I remember when Jabin was the sickest, and we talk about Jabin a lot, A, because I think it's healthy, but B, because you need to understand we're human beings up here. We ain't got it all figured out. You know, when I told Ashley, I said, I I want you to share that. She said, I don't know if I can be that vulnerable. And I said, the people in our church need to know that even we struggle to connect with God sometimes. And we went through a season where, you know, during that whole thing where, my prayer every day, even, even beyond God heal our son, my prayer every single day when I woke up, because I knew she was struggling, was God, hold her close. Don't let her go. Don't let her go. Continue to touch her heart. Don't let it get cold. And in every season where she tries to lean away from you, envelop her in your arms. And when she doesn't even realize it, hold her so close. And that was my prayer every day for her. And I'm proud to say that God has done that. But it was every day. And I'll tell you this. 
even now in, in this season of life, I go through seasons where it's hard to pray. We, and sometimes it's not because I'm hurt or not because of Jabin. It's just because my, my mind won't stop spinning and different things are going on. And sometimes during 21 days of prayer, I come in and, and I, everyone in the room's praying. And I'm like, I'm trying to lock in, but I can't. You know, I'm like, I got I'm, too many things on my mind and I'm trying to move things out of the way. And I'll tell you this. The one thing that gets me in the right perspective with God every single time is when I take, I take a step away from praying for something and I thank God for the prayer he already answered in my life. And there's been multiple times I was walking in this room and I couldn't get my mind right and I couldn't focus and I stopped for a second. And I said, God, thank you. Thank you for holding my wife. Thank you for keeping her. Thank you for holding her close. Thank you for, for keeping her heart soft. Thank you for not failing us. Thank you for answering prayers. We didn't even know how to pray yet. Thank you for holding my wife. And it's like an instant trigger goes off in my heart. And from that place, prayer just starts to flow out of my spirit. But sometimes I got to get realigned with the prayer he's already answered, particularly for me when it comes to Ashley. And so I want to do something special today as we get ready to close. Because I think one of the hardest things to do in our marriage is to pray for our spouse. And so I'm going to pray for Ashley right now. I'm going to pray for her, not as the, the wife of the pastor of this church. I'm just going to pray for my wife. But I want to show some of you husbands how easy it really is to pray for your wife. And then immediately after that, um, our prayer team, is they're going to get in place. As a matter of fact, let's just stand to our feet all across this place. And our prayer team is going to go ahead and get in place. They're going to bring the lights down. I want to pray for Ashley, but then... If you're in this place of needing someone to pray for you, to agree with you, our prayer team's going to get in place. They'll be marked with blue lights all around the auditorium. Some will be up here on the stage. Some will be along the back wall. But if you're in this season of needing someone to pray for you, or, listen, if you're a married couple, I want to challenge you right now. Go somewhere, or even if it's just at your seat, I want to challenge husbands. You pray for your wife, and I want to challenge you wives. Pray for your husbands before you leave today. And that's what we're going to do during our reflection moment today is we're going to connect with God in prayer. If you're single, for yourself and your future spouse, and if you're married, for the person standing next to you, uh, that is, should be your spouse. If it's not your spouse, don't pray for that person. All right, so uh, that would be weird. Uh, so, but I'm going to pray for Ashley, and then we're going to send you to just a couple minutes of prayer. So, Father, I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my prize. I thank you for her beauty and her humility. I thank you for the gift that she is to my life. And God, I pray over her life right now, strength and courage to be a light to every person she's around, that in her workplace, God, people see her as someone to be looked up to. So God, I pray that you place a blanket of courage over her, God, to stand strong in the midst of adversity, to lead me in seasons where it has, I have a hard time seeing you, God. But God, I pray that you intertwine our hearts with you first and then together even more. Let us love you and love each other. We thank you for today and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take three minutes and pray. And then we'll close out service. The team will come out and lead us in a song. We'll worship Jesus one more time. But if you need prayer, our prayer team is out there by the blue lights or by the stage.